can we just quickly, before we dive into today's, or this lesson's properties, <clears throat> this morning, like a whole hour and a half ago, I told you five properties. Do you think we can name them? Do you think we can do it? We did the reverse, which means you integrate in one direction, you integrate in reverse backwards and you get the negative. Give me another one. The dummy property, right? So if you've got a definite integral, doesn't matter what the label is on the variable. You can change it for anything you like. Another one. Okay, symmetry, so you've got odd and even functions. And we've got those two results you're going from negative A to A. Last ones. The round off property, okay, which is the weird name, which is when you are actually doing part of the interval in reverse order, right? So that's the f of x, f of minus x1. And the last one is... <laughs> <laughs> the last one is a reflective property, which we saw has nothing to do with symmetrical functions, but if you take a function and you flip it around, so then you can integrate it over a... Um, um, with a different, like the a minus x instead of x. Okay, and we use, we actually spent the lion's share of our time with get a question that applied that. Okay. So, this lesson, gonna show you two more. One of them I alluded to last time, and hopefully as soon as I say the name, you'll know it, but we wanna state it rigorously. So the next one is the piecewise property. Okay, so the piecewise property is to say, this is an area, I can consider one interval as two different intervals, or as many intervals as I like, sliced into pieces, okay? So for instance, if I have an integral from A to B of some function, then if I like, I can say, well, let's slice it at some point in the middle between A and B. It actually, doesn't middle is probably the wrong word to use because it can be anywhere in between, right? I can go 0 to 1 and 1 to 100, and that's the same as 0 to 100, okay? So I'm going to state that like this. I am going to call it M for like, you know, middle, midway, in between, okay? Same function. And then you do the remainder, however much is left, up to the end. So that's an M to a B of the same function. And um, even though you can sort of finagle it around to work in other ways, we tend to say it for this inequality. We tend to want them to be order in order because otherwise it's just confusing, okay? So that's the piecewise property. Like I said, we used it informally in um, some of the proofs we looked at before. Slice up integrals however you like if it's convenient to you. And the last one is what we call the limit property, uh, or what I call the limit property. Now, again, this is one I sort of mentioned before, but we're going to actually demonstrate it. This is when you have an integral like such. But the integrand is not necessarily defined at your boundary values. Okay, and that's weird. You like sort of uh, taking one of the questions you had to do in one of the exercises. I believe it was one on the square root of four minus x squared. I think. Okay, and so what this thing looks like is well, the square root of four minus x squared. That's uh, what shape the denominator? What shape? What shape is that? Oh, that's a semicircle, right? So if I've got um, x equals negative two and x equals two, the semicircle looks like this. And then you're taking, we've seen this before, if you're doing the reciprocal function, okay? There's an easy spot, which is to say, up there, right? Up there, what is that value? On, on this. This is two. So you take the reciprocal of two, which is a half. So there's one, so a half is there, okay? And because this thing is symmetrical, as this gets smaller and smaller, which is the denominator, the whole function gets bigger and bigger. And of course, it's an even function, so you're getting that, okay? Now, this function, the one on the square root of four minus x squared, is not defined at negative two and two. But if I was to integrate this with respect to x, that's a really easy function. What is that? Sine. That's sine inverse of x on two, which is defined at negative two and two. So you have to be careful with this. But the reason I can therefore work out what this area is, even though it's what we call unbounded, is because if you're careful with your limits, it works just fine. Because think about it this way, right? Um, if I just think about one half of this, because you can just think about one half and double it, okay? Think about what happens as I go, go from, say, um, from naught to, I don't know, call it, call it B, that's your upper boundary, okay? And as B approaches two, as B approaches two, right? What is happening as I get closer and closer to two? What's happening to this area as I approach? Okay, we'll find out. Okay, it's even though up here it's like, ooh, it's going off to infinity, 
But if you think about these as rectangles, because that's what integrals are about, the rectangles are also infinitesimally thin, right? So in fact, just like infinite geometric series, which go on forever, they go on forever in such a way that they still approach, they still converge to something, okay? So if the limit is well defined, your integrand doesn't need to be defined, and that's kind of weird, okay? So to state that formally, here's the way we're gonna say it, okay? The integral from A to B of some function, I can state that as, if one or both of my integrals are not defined, then I'm going to use limit notation to help me. So for instance, suppose my, um, suppose my upper boundary is not defined, okay? I'm gonna take advantage of this piecewise thing. I'm gonna say, well, if the lower boundary is defined, just go from A to you know, some point in there, and that bit's okay, of your function. And then when you're dealing with the other part, clearly because I ended this interval at M, the next interval has to, actually sorry, I need a bit more space. The next interval has to start at M. Sorry, I just need a little bit more room here. But here, right, because like, I want to sort of avoid the fact that mm, this B, right, it's like, what's it going to be equal to? I'm going to use a limit. So I'm just going to say, well, just go to, go to U, right, whatever that might be. And we'll see what happens as U approaches B. Does that make sense? So if you're like, no, I don't, I don't feel comfortable writing something like this when neither of these boundaries are defined, just think about what happens as you get closer. And if it's well defined, if it converges, then you just say, that's what it equals to. Okay, so I'm going to say this, right? So this line, right, is the same as this line, okay? Or another way you could say it is you can just um, substitute. So I'm going to actually give you a whole different way, uh, a whole series of doing this. I can just not worry about dividing it up. I can just say, let's go from A to U as U approaches B, right? That's kind of a condensed way of saying it, but this is kind of happening in the background, right? Or one more way, if it's not the upper boundary that's causing you problems, if it's the lower boundary that's causing you problems, what should I do? Um, U to B. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 that's right. So I'm gonna go from U, I'm gonna make that the thing that approaches something else. The B is fine, if it's well defined. And you say, well this time I want the limit to approach A. So all of these things are the same. They're all different ways of slicing up the same pie. Okay? 